morning everybody. Uh, just on my way to do a vlog at an embryo water that I've never seen before. It's Crown Country Park. There's a couple of lakes there. Uh, but the reason I'm going there, I'm just off the back of what has been a, a really successful little stint of spring fishing using adjustable zigs. Now Dan gave me a call, said he's got a venue for a large part, it's over 40 foot deep. Weather's not ideal, but I am convinced those fish are gonna be up in the water somewhere. It's 20 acres. If we can find them and get three bits of foam up in their faces, I'm sure there's a few bites on the cards. Let's go. But I've had to have a quick pit stop. Desperate for a coffee. See you in a bit. If it was shallower, the teeth of the wind would sort of interest me a little bit, I think. But being 40 to 50 foot deep, early spring, they're going to be up in the layers. Plus, the guy next door said he's seen one not far out, so you know, he, he won't mind if I go left a bit, will he? Power bar of you, mate. No, I am. <laughs> no power bar for me. You're all power, though, Lou. By the way, I think it's important to say yes, it's Lewis, but it's not Lewis Porter. He thought, and I get this, he thought that being on holiday on his birthday in Greece is better than being sat by a rainy lake in Peterborough. What is wrong with the man? Especially with the size of his head, it's a lot of sunshine he's going to be getting. He's got to be careful. The dream is one day to catch a carp as big as, as big as Lewis Porter's head, but you know, them mythical beasts just don't exist. <laughs> uh, poor old Lou. Now, Monkey, you've got your work cut out this trip. I don't mind admitting it. We know very little about it. It's not doing many bites. They're not even showing. But we've, had, we've made the magic happen on occasion. I reckon, uh, I reckon we can make it. And one bite, that's all I'm, I'm putting no pressure. I just want one bite. If not, you could be on that train. Yeah, good, Get over there. Oh, good. So it looks like it's going to be soft and it's granite. Probably just tried to put it into a bit of wood. Yeah, there's definitely a, uh, definitely a root there. Let's have them back a little bit out of the way. There we go. Slightly frustratingly, I've got adjustable zigs set up on all rods, which is great, but I use eight pound cruiser for a lot of my fishing as my hook link, but the minimum on here is 10 pound. So I need to get some new rigs tied. Not to worry, it won't take too long. Let's get them on the rest, ready to go.
all three on adjustables. It's no secret that normally I would um, I'd tip my hook bait with a worm. In fact, if you look at my old rigs on my rods, they've still got worms on from last week, but that's not allowed on here. So it's just gonna be foam. I'm so confident in black foam, but I'm gonna try, I'm gonna put a couple out on black foam and one out on yellow. My, my zig foam just lives in isotonic goo, so we carry a bit of flavor as well. And I'll start I normally say the top third. I was thinking in my head, sort of five, seven, and 10 foot down. But this guy said he's seen him a couple of feet under the surface. So I'm gonna go a little bit shallow, maybe three, five, and seven as a starting gambit. Let's hope with a little bit of luck, we've stumbled across them. It'd be nice to see one for myself, I must admit. It's always, you know, I've no reason to doubt this guy next to me at all. He's a venue regular. You know, it's like you're more confident when you've seen it happen. If I see one show in front of me, you feel like it's game on. But we will keep looking. Now the actual hook link part of the adjustable zig really couldn't, couldn't be any simpler. Like I said, I've got 10 pound cruiser line, um, knotless knotted in this instance to a Kamakura size eight choddy. Now, it's vitally important. I think the most important part of an adjustable setup is the hook. That has got to be razor sharp. You've got so much line out between where your lead is on the bottom. In this instance, I might have 30 to, to 40 foot of line. So if you've got a slightly bird hook, a slightly dull hook, I just don't think it will do enough to hook a fish. And that, that little prick that that hook, that fish feels, talking of little pricks, did you get all that loop? <laughs> so I couldn't resist. Like I say, a sharp hook, very, very important. Now, I know a lot of you will already use these. We'll know exactly what I'm doing. But when you fish an adjustable zig, you PVA foam your hook to the float itself. So when it goes out, as it's falling through the, as it's basically falling through the column, that will come off and you're left with your hook link well out of the way, feel it all the way down to the bottom, and then you start to feed it back up to the surface. Once it's up, you then start to count it back down so you know how many feet under the surface you're fishing. This is gonna be number one, and I reckon I'm gonna put it three foot under, sort of out to the left here. <laughs> that is so deep. <laughs> it's gonna take about a fortnight to get it to come back up. Now, when you're paying off the line, it's important not just to open your bail arm and let it all flood to the surface. Because if you do that, because the float is obviously more buoyant, go away, Frank, because it's obviously more buoyant than my little bit of foam, if you just open the bail arm, that is going to go past your hook bait and potentially cause a tangle. Might not, but I just find it better. Just let off one or two coils of line at a time, let it tighten up and you know you're gonna be tangle free. <laughs> Four hours later. <laughs> I wonder how far back that's come on the swing back. It's gonna pop up like down here. Maybe should have cast that a little bit further. Okay. Now, because it's a little bit windy, I'll explain why I did my rig at the length I did it. I can see my float on the surface and I'm just gonna slowly wind it down so that it's just, just under. Now I know that the length of my rig is from my butt eye to the bail arm. So all I now need to do is grip the line at my, bail, at my butt ring, wind it down, and I know for a fact that my hook bait is now, once I get down here, is exactly on the surface. So now it's simply a case of, of working it back foot by foot until I get it just three foot down. Can even do that at night. I've caught quite a few fish recently, fishing adjustables at night, had a bite, and you learn when you're, when you're paying the line off and the float's coming up, you can feel it under tension. As soon as that float hits the surface, obviously your line goes slack. So you just gauge 
all right, it might not be quite as accurate, but I know that I'm getting it within an inch or two of where it needs to be. So uh, I'm gonna work out, do you know what I'm gonna do? Wait there. My rods don't have a foot marker. So I'm gonna get my rig safe. <laughs> gonna mark out a foot, which is to there. Got me line clip in there in place. I'm gonna go one, two, three. Okay, we are now three foot under. We are fishing. Come on, the carp. Let's get them off switch, we? I wonder what carp think a bit of foam is. Yes, it's got goo on it, which makes it more attractive in my mind, but plenty of people cast out a bit of foam with nothing on it and catch plenty. So what does a, they think it's a snail? Do they think it's a tadpole? Or do they just love foam? That is the question. Another very handy thing to have when doing this type of fishing is a pair of binoculars. It just helps you focus in exactly on where that float is. Once you get over a certain range, I mean, I need glasses, obviously, but even those with the best sight, it's a long way out to watch when a little plastic float is just dipping under the surface. There we go. But once it's there, back to the same thing again. Monkeys on the rods. Three rods out of different depths. I'm going to leave the bins set by the rods. Other than that, it will tidy up. Well, so far, so quiet. There's not too much happening. Um, I've been playing around with the depths of the zig. I started off at three, five, and seven foot down. I've gradually sort of moved each of them up and down a couple of times. Just, just seeing if you can stumble across a, a different thermocline or a level that the carp are sitting. But remember, I'm doing it all without actually definitely seeing a carp in front of me. But you just got to keep on keeping on. Now I've been talking, I've got a guy next to me who's been a member for a few years and he said that notoriously not much happens in the, in the daytime. It's that last light, perhaps an hour before dark, that you might get a chance. But he said certainly early hours in the morning through to about eight o'clock in the morning is when something is most likely to happen. So I still haven't set up properly. I've just got my bed chair out. In an absolute ideal situation, I'll see a couple of shows here this evening so I know that we're on them but I don't want to get everything set up yet because if they start showing somewhere else, then a move will be on the cards. But um, it's been quite nice just sitting here. It would just be perfect now just to see one slide out of the water so we know we're definitely in the right zone. We'll keep looking. I've left it as long as I dare. I don't really want to be putting me bivvy up yet, but this rain is coming down. And whilst I'm quite well sheltered, if I'm not careful, I'm going to get soaking wet and end up staying here for the night anyway and wish I'd have just put me bivvy up. So I'm not saying we're going to be here for the night yet. I just don't want to get everything absolutely soaked when I don't have to. Be fair. <laughs> I only packed away at the back end of last week, look, and I packed away in the wet then. Schoolboy, whatever happens, I've got a wet bivvy already. It's 
sorry Lou mate, it's no room for your bivvy. You'll have to just kick under the stars, all right? <laughs> I'm all right here, Jack. Oh yeah, that is Dees. Lovely view, can see most of, most of what I need to see. Let's get the rest of the kit in. Right, I'm very quickly reeling all three rods in. My rod bag's just gonna fall over. I'm gonna reel all three rods in because I've just seen in quick succession two shows, that hook point's done, two shows out at about 80 yards range. Now that is just what I wanted to see. Darkness is probably an hour or so away. I've been getting all of my bites on my other lake through the hours of darkness and I've now seen, I've just seen one and the guy next door saw one as well out at that range, about 80 to 90 yards. Oh, that's exciting. That is all it takes, isn't it? Just to show and your outlook on the session changes. Come on, lucky five. This way, because you're going out there and all. Well, just as a train goes past in the background, you find me doing battle with a carp. I really didn't know if it was gonna happen or not. But here we are quite, I suppose, relatively early in the night. It's probably about 11 o'clock. And the middle rod, which was Five foot down. Literally can't remember now. <laughs> Middle rod. Yeah, seven foot down. Seven foot under the surface. We are in. now it's just round there to the left somewhere come on come on there he is what a powerful carp <laughs> my goodness Well, if that is anything to go by, these fish know how to ruck. Get in. Right, now, first things first, let's have a little think. Seven foot down that was. I'm gonna bring you down by a foot. So you are now at seven. Have a look at that carp, shall we? Black foam, soaked in isotonic goo. Well, I guess that just shows the power of a zig in the right position. Very, very deep water out there, but adjustable zigs, they spend so much time up in the water early spring. It almost seems madness to have 
especially in this depth, it seems madness to have rigs on the bottom. That'll do. A little bit of luck, it's the first of a, first of a flurry of activity. He's going home, he's going home, he's going. See that, mate? He has not got a clue what just happened. One minute I was up in the water eating snails. Next minute, I'm geezer having his picture taken. What a weirdo. You're a weirdo, mate. Oh, sorry, Lou. say about last night it was all going so well wasn't it found the depth they were feeding out of a bite at seven foot under that lovely linear hopped the left hand rod up to the same height because that was a little bit low and only i can't have even been an hour later that rod went off it went well left caught up with matey's line rounds left it actually got off of that and then it got me in close down in a snag and unfortunately it managed to it managed to get rid of the hook and do the off so I'm still sat here hopeful of another chance, but even if it don't happen, you, you know, you turn up to a lake of 20 acres and you, you nick a couple of bites on your first night, I'd, I'd have took that, I really, really would. Now on a few of these vlogs, we've run competitions with some wicked prizes and this one is no exception. Embryo have very kindly donated a ticket for next season on the Crown Country Park. Now. You'll have the option of either a midweek ticket, which runs, I think it's Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning until Friday at 10 o'clock, I think, or a weekend ticket, which, run, which covers the other hours. Now, in order to win, you've seen the carp I've landed. Hopefully we'll land another one, but if we don't, you've seen the one that's been landed and you just simply need to put a, put a comment in the post below for how big you think it is. And what we'll do, obviously the winner will be the person that gets it exactly right, or it will be the person that's the closest to it. And if in the event more than one person gets it right, then those people will go into a draw and enjoy a season's fishing on embryo. So uh, get commenting. Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. I would love to be doing another night on here. It appears that all the action's coming at night at the minute. All that's left to say is when this comes out, it's still gonna be springtime. And if you're one of these that are sitting on the fence with zigs, be it adjustables or normal, I would suggest you give them a go because they really can be the difference in the spring of, of getting a bite and not. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm, I'm really chuffed with what we've done here. To, to leave with a couple of bites, it'd have been nice to have landed them both. The conditions were far from ideal when we turned up. They did gradually get better, but we've got a lovely upper double to, to add to the diary for the year. We've got another vlog done for your viewing pleasure. So uh, yeah, hope you enjoy it. Can't wait for the next one. Oh, there's a little extra. We put a post up a while ago um, to send us any questions that you wanted answering. Well, we did that. It was all done in the studio. So after this little bit now, there'll be a few of the better ones, or what we felt were the better ones that we've answered. Enjoy. We've put it out to you guys to send us a load of questions. Lewis, I've got my phone here waiting. He is gonna to start to send some questions over to me, and we are gonna do a bit of a quick fire answer round. So Lewis, I guess it's uh, over to you, mate. Oh, first question, here we go. So this is from Aaron Collard. Thanks, Aaron, first of all. Uh, hope you're staying safe and catching loads of carp. Can't wait to see the next instalment of the vlog. My question is, what's your favourite memory or moment you've had and love looking back on during your fishing career? Oh, blimey, Aaron. That, that's quite a tough one because you, you, I guess a lot of people will expect me to go for the some of the real highlights in the, in the filming that I've been lucky enough to do, be that down at Cassian, some of the lovely ones I've caught from Gigantica, 
uh, first 60 pound common, again, monster car, all great memories. But do you know what memory I still look back on and I can still remember vividly as if it was yesterday and that was the capture of my first 20 pounder. Me and my mate Terry Barwick, we joined the Molden Angling Society to fish a lake called Tom Pitt. We'd managed to catch absolutely nothing in our first couple of trips. We didn't have a night ticket. And we'd moved round onto this sort of island swim one day and I could see carp showing. At the time, it felt like they were 150 yards out. But I bet if I walked back to that lake now, they were probably showing no more than 70 or 80 yards and I still couldn't reach them. And I can remember putting on two rigs to cast as far as possible with a single 18 mil activate bottom bait. Got them as close to the fish as I could. And I was sat on my bed chair and I had it, I had it outside leg was out and the back was sort of up when you could sort of control the ratchet so it was more like a chair and as I was laying there my bobbin just fell to the floor and I've literally gone forward fell off my bed picked up the rod ex half expecting it to be a bream but no I was very quickly doing battle with a carp and this carp rolled in the net we couldn't believe it we'd never seen a carp that big but 20 pound eight ounces it will literally stay with me forever. So like I say, it's perhaps not the, the typical answer you'd have expected, but a man's first 20 pounder is always a special memory. Thanks again for the question. Question number two. Ben Fenn, if you could fish one place on earth, then where would that place be and why? Mm. All right, we'll stick down the carp fishing theme and there's a lake that I, I will fish one day that I haven't yet. Again, been lucky enough to travel the world with monster carp and spent a lot of time in France with other various filming projects. But the place that I'd really like to fish is Lake Bled in Slovenia. Not been there yet. So many amazing carp in there, but I want, if you like, I want my piece of history. I want to I wanna have that photo um, with the church in the background. Uh, so, yeah, one day, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be me. I will get there at some point, I'm sure. Lewis is on fire here with the questions. What's been your most embarrassing or worst moment whilst fishing? It is a story I've told before. Sorry, that's from Jake Jones 05. It is a story I've told before, Jake. I was doing a day's filming at the Walthamstow Reservoirs with James Armstrong. I'd never been there before. We were fishing the two and the three. Now, Dovey, being the, the Walthamstow Oracle, I drilled in for information and he said, get to the gate early. I think you're allowed in at six. He said, get there at half three, four o'clock to make sure you're first and get round to a swim that sort of separates the two from the three. I think it might be called the South End. And he said, you want to fish up to the island? It's 100 yards. And he said, but it's undercut. He said, you've got to be so tight to that island that when you lead lands, it's like it almost doesn't land. It's that tight. Well, fish for the morning, had a weird bite that ended up, at, you know, nothing on the end. It could have been a trailer. And James Armstrong had forgotten to bring all of the batteries to do any filming. So he had to go off and buy some. And I said, before you do that, Jimmy, I said, you're going to watch my next cast. We're going to get it right. So we both say that is the one. On about my sixth attempt, I've hit this. I've hit it high. I knew it was high, but I'm just sort of hoping it darts under the trees at the last minute. It did, and we just saw this tiny little plop of a lead right next to the island, and we're like, oh my God, that is the one. Rod's gone down, bobbin's set, we're laughing. Jimmy's gone off, come back with batteries, we've done a bit of filming. It's got to probably half four in the afternoon. Nothing's happened, and we've got about an hour and a half left, so we agreed it might be worth having a rechuck, fresh hook bait, get it back onto the spot. And as I've reeled in, my rig, is about 40 foot up in the tree. And what had happened, where I was using leg clips, the lead had fallen exactly where it was meant to, but unfortunately, my rig had spent all afternoon fishing for squirrels. And to make matters worse, Alan Perry, a guy who still works at Corder now, was fishing in a swim over to the right, and he could see this rig up the tree and thought, who on earth can cast that high? I can. What's next, Lou? Uh, okay, <laughs> what would you do if you had a bad case of the farts? Stay out of the bivvy or stay in the bivvy and suck it up? Well, there's an old saying, I think Shrek said it, you can't beat your own brand. I'd stay in. Cheers for that one, Lou, by the way. Uh, Martin McDonald, can you run through your tattoos, please? Yes, I can. 
if he's watching, Aaron Newport, absolute legend. I said that my children could all choose something that I would have tattooed. Now, Connor, my eldest, big fan of Stranger Things, so you've got the bottom part is of Stranger Things along with the top as well. Emily, my daughter, chose a unicorn, but my daughter's got quite unique hair. She's a redhead with a white streak, so the unicorn has got exactly that. Redhead with a little white streak there. And Freddie, my youngest, a bit like his dad, is a Star Wars fan, so when he said Stormtrooper, yeah, not only was I double happy with his choice, but I let Aaron design it for me. And the only question that's left is, what do I have next? So there you go. Um, uh, Jonathan Jepson said, did you and Dovey miss Ali filming the new series of Monster Carp this time around? Yeah, of course, man. I mean, we've, we've both, I've known Ali for over 20 years. We've filmed Monster Carp for six years. We filmed together, so it, it was the threesome, you know, to not have him there presented initially some new challenges. You know, you're, you've got to approach things slightly differently, but ultimately, me and Dovey have also known each other for a long time. We're mates of 15 years, so when season seven comes out, obviously, we, we really believe you're going to enjoy it. We've certainly enjoyed filming it, but it has got a different feel to it. it how can it not have? Ali is such a unique individual. When you remove someone like that from a show, it's always going to be different. But we hope you like what we filmed. Uh, Dean Kane, 1971, says, My first ever fish caught was a small perch from the Thames when I was six. I can remember that exact day, 44 years later. What was yours? Yep, same as you, probably, mate. I can remember it like yesterday. I was, I'd been fishing once before with my cousin. We'd biked to the... Um, the canal that runs through Malden and caught absolutely nothing. We went back about three weeks later and we fished under this bridge where you could see Tesco supermarket nearby. And my very first cast, you could see all of these small, didn't know what they were at the time. There were so many small fish over on the surface that we were biking along the towpath, saw these fish, so decided that's where we were gonna fish. And my very first bite was a little rough. A lot of people have probably never caught them. We caught thousands of the things. Very, very happy memories. I think I was, I was 11 or 12 when that happened. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, Jake McLaren, or McLaren Jake, as his Instagram name is, what is your most favourite thing about your job? Fishing new venues, meeting anglers, etc. Um, I literally like everything about what I do. My main role is, uh, is head of sales. I'm the sales director for Corda, so um, that, that, is, that is why I've got my job at Corda. The filming side of things and getting to film all these lovely lakes has come across as a, a, very, a very nice side element of what I do. But it, it's probably, do you know, it's probably not only traveling the world to, to do what we do, but part of what you've said, meeting anglers, it's anglers that become friends. Because I, I, I work closely with a lot of the sales guys over in Europe too. Every time you go abroad, you've always got a friendly face to see. And it's, got, you know, it's a big world out there. So to be able to travel there, to meet people you might not have ever met before, but all have that same common interest of a, a mirror or a common carp, and then they become friends thereafter, that, that's a pretty special thing to be able to do. Lewis is on fire here. Is I've locked my phone. Um, okay, the next question is from Len Ingram. Do you mind all of the cameras around you on the bank? Um, no, I, I don't, to be honest. I think when I first started doing it, it would just be, it, like first in magazine features, it was, it was James Armstrong that I went out with first of all, and it was just him taking pictures, and that, all, that was sort of okay, relaxed into it. The first bit of filming I did was a thinking tackle with... Danny over on the Bluebell complex. And that was my first, that was probably the first, when that first started, it was daunting because you didn't own it, it wasn't just one camera, it would be a couple of cameras. You were talking like I am now, talking directly down the lens to people. Then it felt very, very alien. But as the years have progressed, same as anything, the more you do something, the more comfortable you get at doing it. And it, it's just second nature. You now it adds a pressure to your fishing. Um, because you, you always want to you always want to win, you want to get that result whilst the camera's there. So whilst it's lovely when it happens, it does add that element of sometimes frustration when the cameras are trying to film what you're doing. All you want to do is get 
a rig at 60 yards where you've just seen a load of bubbles come up or you've seen a fish show. So that's the only thing that's frustrating when you can't do everything as quick as you would if you were just fishing for yourself. But I'm certainly not complaining about what we get to do. And pressure at the end of the day is a privilege. Um, McLaren Jake, is that the same person? Yes, you've got two questions in. Um, because you've fished all of the lakes at Norton Disney, what is your favourite lake at the Norton Disney complex? Um, I've got things I like about a couple of them. I mean, I love all the lakes. I've caught from all of them, earlier vlog. Can't remember what number it was, number four maybe. Um, when I made Lewis walk around the whole complex, tired us both out for a couple of days. And whilst I enjoy them all, two are probably where I get the most enjoyment from. The, my most favourite is Pettit's because it, the, the fishing can be quite tricky. Again, if you've seen that early episode of the vlog, we couldn't have timed it any better. There was water being pumped in, the fish were showing for fun, and it, it made a tricky lake incredibly easy. But those factors aside, when you turn up to fish that place normally, you've got, a, you've got to work to get your bites. But when you get your bites, there is every chance it's over 20 pound. There's a strong chance it's over 25 pound. And you know, you go there expecting, if you're on a few fish, you almost expect a 30 pounder now. And it's not, it's not many day ticket waters that you can turn up and have that frame of mind. So that's the first one. And the second one is probably Billy's Lake. So it's arguably one of the easier waters on the venue. But what I like about it, I like having the option to fish at long range. I really enjoy range fishing. Don't get me wrong, if they're shown at 20 yards, then I'll catch them at 20 yards. But a couple of times I've fished it and you build up a good hit of fish, fishing at sort of 120 yards. And it's very, very rewarding when you're repeatedly spawning at that range, you're getting three rods on a spot and you start to get multiple bites. I've always loved that style of fishing. When it feels like the harder you work, the more fish you catch. So they're probably my two favourite, but as I say, I enjoy just being up there. Um. <laughs> Craig Mahoney, someone had to ask this. Will he ever catch James's? Do you know what, Craig? Who knows? I'm going to keep my ticket. I've got no plans to fish there this year because we've got a lot of filming projects on. Um, but, but we'll have a go. I've got at least one trip on there. My, my friend of mine, unfortunately, unfortunately died uh, before, before New Year. So we've done a charity thing where you can pay a tenner, enter a raffle, come and have a fish for 48 hours because Carl, the owner of Northwick, has given me a lake exclusive. Who knows? Perhaps it will show up then. Probably to one of the guests I take over. We'll see, mate. Richard Cutts, any tips on using zigs as I struggle to use them? Uh, yeah, of course, Richard. So um, without really knowing what it is you struggle with, I'm going to assume it's struggling to get bites on them. And I would say the first mistake or the first, the first thing that a lot of people do when they're, they're putting a zig out is exactly that. They're putting one zig out. They're putting two on their favoured method and then they're putting one out on a zig. And because you perhaps haven't got the confidence in it, you might leave that zig sat there, either leave it sat there all day at one height and that's it. Or you might give it 45 minutes, hour and a half and think, nah, zigs are not for me and reel it in and put one of your bottom bait rigs out. Now, I totally understand that because I was the same for many years, but I think it was, I think it was Elliot Gray that said to me, when he fishes zigs or when you fish zigs, it's about finding the depth that those carp are in. And the only way you're gonna find that depth is by putting all of your eggs in one basket and putting all of your rods on that method. Don't just give it an hour and a half, commit all three rods to it, change the depths, change the colour of your hook bait, maybe tip it with a worm if, if other species allow. Um, and I'm sure you'll, once you get that first bite, you'll be as addicted to them as I am. <laughs> what is there more, more than in the world? Doors or wheels? This has been going round and I, I can't work it out. I don't, well, there is no answer, is there? So I'm just going to go, uh, so if you think of a car, you've got four doors, plus is the, does the boot count as a door as well? And then you've got four wheels plus a steering wheel. So it doesn't really say what, then you've got cogs in the engine. I'm going to go wheels. Who knows? Oh, but then what about all the advent calendars in the world? They've all got 24 doors on. This is why it's going round and round, isn't it? I'm going to go with wheels and we will very quickly move on. Um, has anyone been sorted for the podcast role yet? Yes, and I'm very pleased to announce that it's someone I'm not allowed to say, but all will be revealed very, very soon. 
Come on, Lewis, I'm waiting for you here, mate. Okay. <laughs> you well thought I was going to say the name then, didn't you? <laughs> I saw you look up. <laughs> I've had nothing come through. Have you not? Have you sent one? Oh, shit, sure, I sent it to Tom. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be about Tom then, isn't it? Tom's going to be like, what? What's he on about? Tom Dove has sent a question in, which is fact, one minute ago. Busy, are we, Tom? Hi, Neil. Would you say you're a terrible dad because you're fishing all the time? P.S. Would love to meet you one day. Um, well, Tom, no, I wouldn't. I'd like to think I'm a fantastic dad, but I'll put that question back to you. Would you say you're a terrible dad because you're fishing all the time? You fish almost as much as me. Don't know why you're starting. Bad hair day again, every day. Anyway, let's move on. Ah, Gary Baker. It was a comment from one of the vlogs saying um, he doesn't think I'm allergic to maggots because I is a registered nurse and my use of the word allergic wasn't accurate because I'm touching them. Uh, um, if I was really allergic to them, then I wouldn't be able to touch them, I think was what he was saying. He said, at worst, I have a sensitivity to them. All I can say to you, Gary, is that I um, every time I use maggots, I get... Um, a reaction the same as you'd expect with hay fever, runny nose, itchy eyes. If where the maggot has been on a hook, if that hook goes in my finger, that will itch for about, I don't know, a couple of hours. I know it's going on. All of my neck comes up in little hives. So I assume that was an allergic reaction. I may be wrong. Either way, I don't enjoy using them. Craig Palmer says Karen. Um, <laughs> football coach Dan says, Spoons, what advice would you give someone who's been away from fishing for a few years but has recently returned? It's going to be boring advice, football coach Dan, but I would say just get out there and do what you were doing before and just enjoy yourself, mate. There's lots of day ticket lakes up and down the country you can drop in. There's normally a club that you perhaps were a member of before to get back onto some of your favourite lakes. Just get out and go fishing. You'll soon catch up with the way the industry may have changed. If you've been out for a few years, the methods that you were using a few years ago will still get you bites today. Enjoy it, mate. Another one from Jake McLaren. You're, you've, you're sending in some very popular questions, mate. So what, what is, what are your three favorite goos? First one is easy, and that is the isotonic. I can remember the trip, and it, it transformed that trip for me. I wasn't getting bites on anything. I could clearly see the fish out there and we were playing with these new goos that weren't coming out yet. And as soon as I put an isotonic hook bait into the lake, literally it was out there for two minutes and I've had a bite. Now you might, as I did at the time, I've got that fish in the net, I've put the rig back out there, and it went after about five minutes. I've landed that one as well, and just thought to myself, as a lot of people will have thought, the fish have just turned up. They're working their way through the bait. There's not as much left out there, so now you're getting bites. So I put two rigs back out there with one had a pair of tiger nuts on and can't remember the other one. I'll be honest, I can't remember what it was. But they sat out there and it was 45 minutes to an hour, hadn't had another bite and curiosity got the better of me, wound the rod back in, isotonic back out and away it went. And, and since then, I've caught, admittedly it's probably because I use it more than most of the others, but I've caught so many carp on that that it's, it's very quickly become my go-to hook bait. Um, after that, probably the pink squid. I think um, now there's, there's a white version coming out very, very soon, which I've been using as well. But the pink one, again, you hear stories from anglers who, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You, you, you hang on every word they say, you listen to how they fish, you know their ethos on bait in particular. And that angler was Elliot Gray. Now he wasn't a fan of the goo back in the early days, but I think he had a session on the Essex Quarry and he had three rods out, two with his favoured I'm going to say white hook baits, and they put a pink gooed up one in the middle. And in the morning, the fish came round, the pink goo went first, and then over the course of the next hour or so, the other two eventually went. He put it down to a bit of luck, I think, as again, we all might. So the following morning, ready for the feeding spell, he now had the two, I think, the two outside rods on goo, and the middle one back on his white one. Once again, the two pink ones went, I'm sure, if I remember the story right, I'm sure he had a bite on his left hand rod, he's landed it as the right hand rod's gone and again the white one eventually went before he put all three over to the pink and in his words he could barely keep a rod in the water. 
So um, that, that's another strong one in my armory. And I like to have three different colors. So I've got a good yellow there, I've got a good pink, and then I like a white one as well. And that for me is Wonderberry. It's like a, a black currant flavor, always, always done well for me. Certainly in the winter, it's one I use quite a bit. So if I could only pick three, it would have to be them. Well, there we go. That's all the questions answered. I know it's a little bit different, but thank you very much for watching. The next vlog, though, is going to take place whilst undergoing a very special project. Now, I can't tell you any more for now. Like and subscribe, though, and watch this space. It'll be with you before you know it.